And freedom to succeed, it was always something I loved before, which is, but it's, it, when you think about it, it's about unleashing the potential and creating a framework for people to be the very best they can be closer to the customer. Now, when you think about that, there are different layers of, if you're a finance person, a HR person, or you're an ops person in how you do that. So how do we release CapEx to the team on the ground to enable them and give them complete control? Freedom to succeed can also be freedom to fail so they can innovate and be a little bit more entrepreneurial and commercial closer to the customer because that's where we make better decisions. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. This episode is kindly sponsored by Attractions IO, the guest experience platform behind Merlin Entertainment's San Diego Zoos and the PGA Championships branded mobile apps. And just like us, the team at Attractions IO is on a mission to elevate the guest experience and ensure that they exceed the expectations of today's digitally native guests. By combining a branded mobile app, with an operator console that consolidates behavioral data from every touch point in the guest journey, the Attractions IO platform empowers operators with the tools they need to increase guest satisfaction, spending, and loyalty. And to learn more about how Attractions IO can help you connect your end-to-end -end guest experience, visit attractions.io/slash how it works. Hey Matt, how's it going? It's going really well. Oh, good. I'm very glad to hear that. Wait but a minute. It's also, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's also fantastic. Oh, good. Good. I was a little worried for a yeah, second. Yeah. Question for you. You got it. Have you ever played golf? Many times. It, really? Well, okay. Mini golf or real golf? Uh, well, at first I was thinking real golf. Is that many times? <laughs> I don't see you as much of a golfer. I, not, not that you know. There's anything wrong with that. I, I would just be surprised. I am not a golfer, but I, I think I've played on a real golf course maybe three times. But I've played mini golf many, many times. All right. What's the uh, the most unique environment you've played mini golf in? Mini golf. Um, I have done blacklight golf. Ooh. Okay. So I'd have to say, you know, when you think about a lot of mini golf courses, they're somewhat similar. Some are very cool in terms of the the landscaping and that kind of thing, but they're they're outdoor putting golf courses, right? Um, but I think in terms of the uniqueness, as you say, that black light experience was pretty cool. Yeah, How about you? No, I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, and all of these locations that you've played mini golf in, were they were they all above ground? <laughs> I thought I knew where you were going with this question. Yes, they were above ground. I could see sunlight. Ah, well, except for the black light one. That was, right, that, was yeah. that was inside, but I did not have to go below grade to get there. What? Why do you ask? Such an interesting well, question. Well, we've talked a, a few times and we've kind of just spitballed and joked around some ideas of like blending different attraction types like VR, axe throwing and, you know, things like that. And uh, we get to learn today amongst many other things and a, and a lot of broad topics. But uh, but Aid Jones talks about what it's like playing underground golf at Zipworld in the UK. When he first said that, I was just, I was blown away. I wanted to sit down, like my knees were weak. Like, where do you come up with underground golf? Now, there's a lot of places that obviously have golf, mini golf, real golf, whatever you want to call it. A lot of places have cave tours, you know, where you go down in the cave. I'm thinking of like Silver Dollar City and, you know, cavern, you know, tourism destinations and that type of thing. But to combine those two and say, we're going to play golf underground. And by the way, we're also going to have a zip line underground in the caverns. I mean, that's, I would like to go to Wales anyway, but yeah. sign me up. I'm on my way. 
So Attraction Pros takes North Wales. Right? <laughs> yeah. And top attraction there. So uh, a great, great uh, setup into who we get to talk to today. Aid Jones, he's the CEO of Zip World in the UK. Uh, uh, such an, an immense an amount of experience in the industry. He was with Merlin Entertainments for uh, quite a while in a variety of different positions, including the general manager at Madame Tussauds in Las Vegas. Uh, he was the general manager at Legoland uh, Florida when it opened uh, in, uh, in 2011. Um, and has taken on uh, several other new roles with concept development and uh, managing all the midway attractions. And most recently in December 2020, uh, returned back to uh, uh, closer to home for him to the UK, uh, where he is the CEO of Zip World, which features a, a number of different attractions, including the fastest zip line in the world. And as we know now, underground golf. <laughs> That's right. And what I think is so fascinating is the breadth of this conversation really encompasses a lot just about adventure travel and adventure tourism, right? And so there's a lot around around that and what that what that looks like in kind of the future of that. Um, but he also talks about the people agenda that he's got uh, at Zip World and how he really allows people the freedom to succeed which can also lead to the freedom of fail, freedom to fail, um, and we we do get to kind of dive into some of his favorite failures. Um, but I think those are two really incredible topics that we get to explore with him. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you know, we get to hear about you know what the last few months have been like of him uh, taking on this new role with Zip World and um, really getting to know his team, getting to know his people, working the front lines, which he said is just absolutely so critical. Uh, not to mention enjoyable to you know to do that as well. Uh, and we get to hear about his past experiences as well. So I, I, I had the opportunity. I, I also uh, was part of the team that opened Legoland Florida. Um, Technically, I was a third-party contractor. I worked for Pixolv, the uh, souvenir photo company, but um, but really got to see everything that Aid did in Winter Haven to get that park open. And uh, one of the things that really fascinated me was uh, how, how well he built advocacy with the local community so that the community could really embrace the park as well, uh, even though that, that property had gone through some turbulence over the last uh, several years. So there was a lot of initial hesitation um, and we get to hear how he was able to, to take that on. So I think that there's uh, just a, a lot of great lessons that come from this interview. So should we zip on over to the interview and uh, let's hear from Aid? Let's zip right underground and uh, get right to it. Hey, Aid, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. We are so excited for our conversation today. How are you? I'm well, thank you, from uh, a somewhat sunny North Wales. So yeah, uh, good. Good to see you both. Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, so Aid, to kick this off, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us about your background in the industry. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I've been a veteran of the industry. Um, started at um, Alton Towers when I was um, at school, um, school holiday jobs, serving burgers and ice creams and the like. So I can say I started on the shop floor, really fell in love with theme parks, actually. Um, and then I did my um, informative years at university. Uh, my placement was actually at Alton Towers. And uh, it's, it's ironic, actually, because uh, they've come full circle. They, they're about to relaunch uh, Gloomy Wood and the, uh, the the haunted house ride there. And, uh, and I, that was actually in 92. I was uh, I was in charge of uh, one of the restaurants in in, uh, in the Katanga Canyon there. So I just anyway, and they've just retired Nemesis as well for a little bit. So I was anyway, going back to my roots, but um, started there. I uh, got a job in the marketing department after I graduated, uh, working with uh, Nick Varney's uh, marketing team and uh, Mark Fisher and people like that, who then went on to obviously grow Merlin and create Merlin. And uh, so I started in Two Swords, um, the Two Swords group, I progressed, I went to theme parks, went uh, into sponsorship roles, and then I moved to America in 2004. <clears throat> and... Um, was general manager of Madame de Swords in Las Vegas in the Venetian Hotel. Um, and then I opened up a couple of businesses, uh, the first at Legoland Discovery Center in Chicago, I led the team that opened that, and the Madame de Swords in Hollywood. I moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years. And then the Legoland Florida job was being talked about. Um, and it was the time, it was the biggest project in Merlin. And I, really, really thought this is my opportunity to get back into theme parks, which I kind of missed being in the midway. And then I moved to Florida. I got the job and I led the team that um, 
opened, uh, converted Cypress Gardens into Legoland, Florida, and then did a 10 year business plan to move it to be a resort positioning, you know, with two hotels and now three. Um, and they've, they've taken that on board and grown that business to what it is today, actually, you know, 12 years on from when it opened or 11 years on from when it opened. Um, and then I went to, I got promoted, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because I really love Legoland Florida, but I got promoted to uh, do the Midway for North America uh, with all the different brands, Sea Life, Mallard Swords. Uh, and so I went back into Midway and um, was on living on planes quite a lot, traveling around the, the world, uh, sorry, the North America and the world, actually. Um, and then I moved into a concept development job um, which was looking at new brands. So one of the projects I worked on last time was the Peppa Pig theme park brand. And I did a touring man of swords in Philadelphia. You know, things that were a little bit experimental, getting into VR and things of that nature. And then COVID happened and I left Merlin and uh, and then I went to work for a company called Art Tech House. So I, I saw the growing immersive art theater with, with Van Gogh and these like, and Art Tech House had a very fun brand. It was very specific into science and technology and it was a brand I, I really liked the look of. And I went to work for them in Three Sites and um, and um, they they were looking at expanding and we were, you know, brought a level of professionalism, brought some team into that. And then um, the job at Zipwell came up and I decided to move back to the UK. I think I'd already already thought that I was going to go back eventually. And then this opportunity came to me and I've uh, been in this job for three months now. Excellent. Aid, can you tell us a little bit about the experience at Zipworld for people who haven't uh, haven't heard of it? Yeah, like me about two years ago. Um, Zipworld is, well, firstly, it is a collection of brands that started in North Wales and they are, it's pivoted. The, the company started doing zip lines, but zip lines in incredibly unique environments. Um, slate quarries in North Wales, Penryn quarry, was the, is the, and it's basically it's the fastest zip line in the world. And but the 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 what makes it so special is the environment that they're in. So the adventure market is growing massively in North Wales and in and in, in and in the UK in general, and people seeking these adventures. But the the thing about Zip World is we we do the zip lines, but we also do things like treetop treks. We do these uh, zip lines in trees, uh, but we've also got uh, one of our sites in Cleckworth. We've got caverns, underground mines where you can do bounce below on trampolines. We've got underground golf, and then you've got zip lines through the caverns underground, as well as long zips overground in these incredible quarries. So there is this, there's these brands that are very family, and there's also thrill, thrill brands in these unique environments. Um, and we've since expanded our, our footprint into Manchester, Windermere, and we're looking at sites in the Lake District and uh, the big district. So there are, you know, expansion within quarries that are no longer used and turning them into uh, tourism destinations, but being very mindful of uh, protecting the environment. And, you know, ESG strategy is extremely important to us. Yeah. Excellent. Sounds like like just unbelievable experiences. Uh, so you said you you came on board uh, three months ago, so around December of of 2022. Uh, what have the last three months uh, been like? What have been some of your biggest uh, priorities? What's uh, has it been on your your agenda? Well, the first thing is obviously to get to know the people, and the, and the people here are uh, incredibly passionate actually. And and our, our our staff schools are off the off the off the charts. I mean, people love what we do. Uh, our net promoter scores and our customer scores are incredible, incredibly high. So much so that I was like, really? Um, but when I got under the skin, it, it's part and parcel of the, the, the sheer exhilaration of the product. It, it is breathtaking and it's out of this world uh, in terms of the experience that you get, the instructors that, you know, obviously safety is paramount to us. Um, but the instructors create this, in, 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 almost this in, most in memorable journey from when they arrive to when they actually go through their experiences. And the same can be said for, you know, for uh, kids when they go on the zip lines or they go on the, we've got, we have a coaster that goes through the trees and it's their first coaster experience. And so there's lots of things that we do that um, are extremely memorable. 
So that was the first thing, was to get to know the people. And the second thing really was then to just get um, under the skin of the business from a strategy point of view. What 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 are our growth opportunities? Where How can we be more professional with our branding? Um, and the reason I say that is because I think it's a little bit, we, we weren't selling ourselves hard enough in the context of we've been this North Wales operator and with this incredibly beautiful portfolio of brands. But we, we need to be a little bit more um, aggressive in the way that we describe our brands, who we are, what we have. Because when I describe underground golf, underground, uh, now people go, really? What is that all about? So we obviously haven't done a good job putting our best foot forward to communicate that. So that's the second piece. And then the third piece really is, is really working on the five-year plan, um, the, the cultural principles of the business, the people side of it, um, and making sure that we have a people agenda that is uh, defining and, and enabling our, our growth and our opportunity to grow, not only in our existing sites, but in, in new sites. So you haven't been busy at all for the last couple of months. Ah. <laughs> no. uh, aside from trying to find a house, um, exist again in the UK and just settle in. Yeah, it's been it's been fun, but the three well, last three months have flown by. Flown I'm by. sure. Yeah, so I'm just about acclimatizing to the English weather as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, Aid, you mentioned a couple of times underground golf, and um, Josh and I have joked many times before <laughs> about combining, you know, different experiences, and that's not one that we had thought of, you know, putting golf underground. So I definitely want to unpack that a little bit later, but I'd also love to go back because you said, you know, you started, you know, serving burgers and ice cream and kind of fell in love with the industry, and I'm curious, what was it about the theme park industry that you fell in love with? Uh, it was simple, really. I thought, um, you know, I had friends who worked in factories and pop banks in Stoke-on-Trent. And I think the key for me was it, we were selling fun um, and it was easy. It was like we were putting smiles on people's faces. And it sounds corny, but it was true. It was, you know, people came there and we were all laughing and joking and we were selling roller coasters and, and selling rides and putting in smiles. And even the food was fun and quirky. And, you know, and it was, I just fell in love with the vibe of the place and the sheer fun. And it comes from, um, you know, years of going to Alton Towers as a kid and the, the sheer delight. It was like that feeling on Christmas morning, you know, it's uh, we're going to Alton Towers. Um, so I think I got it there. But I also was very fortunate to work with some great people, great leaders and great uh, mentors who've really, really helped me um, nurture the way I am in my leadership style and the way that, um, and I think that alone, if, if I'd have been managed by bad people, I might have gone work somewhere else, but I was very fortunate. So I think it was product, making people happy and the people uh, that really, really just, I never left. <laughs> <laughs> So you talk about the the people that made such a strong impact on you and your development of the industry. Uh, you also mentioned, uh, you know, one one of your biggest priorities. The first one is getting to know the people, and I, I would love it if if we can come back to that at, um, and and if you could expand on that as far as uh, really coming in as the new CEO and wanting to make a positive impression on your team and really being able to. Uh, kind of build the confidence in your team coming in really as, you know, as the new CEO, as a new employee of the organization while getting to know the team as well. Can you share a little bit about how you've been able to do that? Well, firstly, I uh, was available. I was seen. So I set a goal of getting out to the businesses and working two days on the floor, physically working with the front team, which uh, was, a, was a priority for me, not only because I love it, I love actually doing it, but you learn a hell of a lot. And People who've worked with me know that I'm very passionate about the customer interface and, and how we develop people and make the teams understand what the priorities are. Um, and you only can only do that by working the front door or working the, you know, loading a uh, roller coaster or whatever it is. You you learn things. Instinctively, you can walk in a site and you can know from your, you know, your days of, you know, that branding isn't right or that wayfinding's wrong and all those kind of things. But the trick is to bring people with you so they understand it and you sow seeds with them. I say this a lot to my team. I'm, I'm, I'm sowing the seed and you want to be there. Um, so that was the that's the first thing I've done. And and then secondly, I've we've done a bit of restructuring here, um, but we've been really clear about what the objectives are in terms of people agenda. So, for example, I've said to the exec something that they didn't do was they 
we had an introduction from an exec member at every single orientation. All right now, coming into an organization that's never done that before, those, those things are a big deal, right? So I could give you a list of things that we've done. We had a leadership a day. We, we brought agencies in to talk to the teams. We've, we're doing some mentorship now, which hasn't been done before because it was a small business that's just suddenly exploded. Um, so now it's about building, uh, you know, reducing turnover and building cultural principles and building behaviors. And I've always been of the principle, you have to, you have to show that, you have to be available, you have to be doing those things. Um, and, and making some seismic changes. Um, and they may not seem seismic changes, but they are statements of intent, like delivering a skip to the entrance of base camp, which is our head office, and having a clear out of loads of old documents and crap that's been stored for four years. No, but it's a statement of intent that this is our environment that we work in, and we want to improve our environments where we are. And funny enough, it's, it's remained remarkably tidy since that happened. <laughs> okay. So there's there's lots of little things like that. There are actually big statements that I've done in the past two or three months with with the help of the team, you know. That's awesome. I love that phrase, statement of intent. But there's another phrase that I love that you you mentioned, which is people agenda, which I have not heard it put that way before. And you also mentioned that as the as part of the growth plan, right? So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the mindset behind, you know, focusing. I mean, obviously focusing on people is important, but focusing on an actual people agenda as you are thinking about expansion plans. Yeah, I think it well, firstly, it starts with the, the basics, you know, making sure orientation, we're getting the right people in, uh, we are we are identifying talent, we are reward and recognition, all the basic HR stuff that you hear. But it's also a, a, another layer to that for me, which is about you know, talent mentoring one-to-one, how do you uh, develop people, how do you push people into places they don't necessarily want to be or think they can be or ought to be. Uh, leadership development, people uh, management, managing people, all these things um, that, 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 that are the normal HR that you would see in a professional organization that I'm bringing here, fine. But the, the big thing for me is the cultural principles. The cultural principles, for example, one of the, one of the new ones I've introduced, which is an, an old two swords one, but one that I've seen a lot is freedom to succeed is one of our new principles, right? And freedom to succeed, it was always something I loved before, which is it, 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 when you think about it, it's about unleashing the potential and creating a framework for people to be the very best they can be closer to the customer. Now, when you think about that, there are different layers if you're a finance person, a HR person, or you're an ops person in how you do that. So how do we release CapEx to the team on the ground to enable them and give them complete control, freedom to succeed can also be freedom to fail so they can innovate and be a little bit more entrepreneurial and commercial closer to the customer because that's where we make better decisions rather than it being head office saying this, do that, don't do this. So we're three months in of, of a journey that's going to completely transform the way we do business. And a lot of people watching the podcast probably say, well, we do that already. Well, great. Um, but I still think that that's a philosophy that's very dear to me. And it's one that's relatively, I wouldn't say new to the team because they are quite dynamic and entrepreneurial, but the way that we're structuring it and the way that we're doing it in a, in a little bit more of a calculated way um, is, is what I would call the people agenda. Okay. Love it. So this, this freedom to succeed concept is very, is very empowering to the frontline team. You said to, to innovate, to be entrepreneurial. You also said there's, there's the freedom to fail with it as well. So being able to kind of give them the opportunity to sort of learn from their mistakes, to be able to iterate, to be able to, to do it, do it again better next time. And ultimately they become uh, better at the role. They deliver a better guest experience and, and there's the overall enhancement to the culture. Uh, how do you put guide rails around that so that there is uh, really, really a defined structure to say you've got the freedom to succeed. There will likely be failure along the way, but only failure to a certain extent till yeah. we'll intervene and we'll help you course correct. Well, there's lots of processes and, and you know, CapEx approval processes is a good one. Um, 
you know, for a business of our size, you know, restricting the amount of capex that we think is limited to a site. If, if we make a mistake with a five or a ten grand, it can make a massive difference to the sharp end. But but also more fundamental than that is the way you deal with it. So if somebody is frightened to fail, or there is a there is a um, you know they won't take any risks. Um, and and so there's a there's a bit about risk adverse and being risk supportive to being uh, to make us more dynamic and a little bit more um, you know cutting edge uh, and I and I think also how you respond to that so my example is bad leader would say why did you do it that way you shouldn't have spent that money what a waste da, 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 da. best leaders well what did we learn from that yeah it didn't quite deliver what we wanted. But wait, well done for trying. Let's see if we can not make that mistake here. But actually, we did learn this about it, that it, it did work to this extent or not. Um, and the best leaders I've ever worked for have been like that with me. Um, and, you know, failure is is just part and parcel of what, what you do to be better. Uh, and the amount of times I've failed is, is unbelievable. But, you know, you manage the process and you learn from it. And to answer your question... As long as you're doing it within a framework that means that you're not exposing the business to massive risk, then why not? You know, that's just the that's just the nature of a dynamic business for me. Yeah. So, A, do you have any of those uh, failures that you would consider some of your favorites because you've learned something <laughs> and and you can uh, you can use that to move forward in the future? I opened a can of worms there. Don't for that question. <laughs> um, it was already on the list. We were going to ask it anyway. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a few. I mean, some of the marketing ones I've done in the past. I think the, the very first one of a feeling of failure I had was when I printed a load of flyers for a, a, a corporate event that I was doing, and uh, I I didn't check it with the uh, with the corporate customer, and they said it's the wrong logo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know that, that that was probably the first one, and a certain Mark Fisher, who uh, sorry to name drop, but the you know uh, ex Merlin was my boss at the time, and he did manage it quite well, but I was quite uh, uh, scared at the time when I told him. But um, yeah, another one was a marketing campaign with for Glenn Earlham. Actually, it was um, I was uh, I did a campaign for the top five rides, ride the five rides at Wooden Towers, and prove you're not a jelly, right? And I did this uh, campaign with with uh, Jay Walter Thompson. And I thought this this visual and this campaign was the best thing I'd ever done. It was this big jelly. It was, it was targeting students, and it was brilliant. And Glenn Hill at the time pulled me in, and he went, "Have we done this campaign?" I went, "Yeah, it's great. I do this." And he just pulled this poster to pieces. <laughs> you know, and and I had that on my wall. I've still got that picture. So it's not here yet, but uh, I will have it on my office wall because. He was absolutely right. What I learned on the marketing principles, the way he did it, it didn't, it wasn't clearly defined. It didn't say what it did. It was too generic. Um, and funnily enough, it didn't do very well. But I, you know, I learned a lot from that. So there, there were marketing ones. Um, I've done a few product ones, but to be honest, the product ones, uh, we, we've either done it wrong and then we've circum circled back and made it work. So you can't say it's ultimately a failure because we actually learned something from it. Um, one thing I did quite a lot at Legoland was I would go to Legoland California, Legoland Windsor and places like that and, and ask them, I want the good, the bad and the ugly on every product they did. So the Legoland Hotel is the Legoland Hotel because I got the answers to those three questions for all for the other two or uh, three hotels that were available. And we just didn't, we did more of the good and better, did more of the better stuff. We just didn't do the ugly, and we we fixed the bad. And it and it, and it was a very simple strategy when you actually put it down on paper. Um, so I suppose, I suppose, yeah, we all have failures, but but how you manage the failures, I think, is the is the the backdrop to that. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for sharing those. We uh, we really appreciate you uh, you opening up and uh, and giving those examples. So I uh, would love to flip it to the other side of the coin then actually talk about uh, some of the biggest highlights, the biggest uh, successes and uh, some of the proudest moments that you love to share. Yeah, the proudest moments are actually, uh, I'll start with the ones that really give me the most pride, which is actually when I've, when people have worked for me and developed and gone into other jobs, again, a cliche, but I've got a lot of people who are divisional directors or who've gone on to other roles that work for me for a few years. And I get immense pride out of that. You know, I'm not going to mention too many names because I'm embarrassed them if they watch this podcast, but there's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a chap who went over to Asia who worked for me. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, Rex who's a 
you know, in Legoland, Florida, it was was I brought him in as the marketing director. He's now over all the Legoland parks in in, in North America. I'm proud of what he's doing. And, um, oh, there's a lady in charge of Peppa Pig theme park who started at admissions. You know, and I didn't. I, there's a lot of people like that that will kind of just go, you know, well done. Um, and staying with my Madam Swords days as well. So I'll start there. I think. Um, highlights for me uh, probably Legoland, Florida, um, just because of the the sheer scale of the project and the the pressure on the team to deliver something in what was incredibly difficult circumstances in terms of time, uh, money, and just just overall um, the stubbornness of Cypress Gardens, to be honest. Eh? Uh, it, it, but what we delivered there for the budget on time on budget was nothing short of a miracle. And then the the, the, the I got massively into the local community and, and Orlando in general. Obviously, I was uh, I got heavily involved in in visit Orlando and and chaired that for a couple of years. And I, I just fell in love with the Winter Haven community and, and still love them immensely. Still got a lot of friends there. And, and you know, when I went for the interview in 2010, I remember going to Winter Haven and thinking it's a bit of a sad place. Um, when I last went there, it was not night and day. It was, uh, it was completely different and businesses were all open, brand new signage, you know, the economic impact that Legoland made to not just with cash, but also, you know, hope. Uh, jobs for kids, uh, for young people, um, working with the local college, Polk State. You know, there were so many positive things that we did and working with the city of Winterhaven. I think that's probably the most proudest proudest I've been. Um, and then, you know, uh, moving back to England, I think, is also an achievement, uh, having done 18 very successful years in America and then moving back to to, to family here, which I think is, is, a, is a personal one, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, talk a little bit about um, your vast experience all over the world, literally, right? Because I think a lot of people will be in one country. Maybe some people are in the same state over here in the United States for, you know, most of their lives or, you know, their professional lives. And I'm wondering- With no passport. <laughs> with no passport, exactly. <laughs> I'm wondering what kind of- um, what kind of benefits do you think you have experienced in being able to work in so many diverse cultures and areas of the world um, to now be able to implement those in your in your current role? Yeah, it's it, it's funny. It's, funny, it's a good question actually because it's very relevant actually to me at the moment because I'm working with a lot of people here who know nothing but North Wales, and um, so I'm giving them examples to go and look at of this shop or this ride or this policy, or this new technology, or this process, you know. And I'm, yes, I'm, I'm pulling from my experience and what I've done before, but I will also give them pointers for companies I've worked with or examples of things to look at at different sites that they would not have no idea about because uh, they either haven't been on a ride or been to the site or been to the culture or spoken to the people or whatever it is. So... You know, it's been interesting. You know, this is the first time I've been a CEO, but it's been very useful for me to use that knowledge from particularly from North America because it is has the very best in everything that is attraction based, in my opinion. Yeah, you could say that there are European parks and Chinese parks and things that Japanese parks that have a bit of a slightly different edge, but let's be honest, North America is where it's at with a lot of groundbreaking innovation for ride technology, immersive uh, tech, uh, theming, accommodation, whatever it may be. So having that as a reference point from all my travels and my meetings in various different attractions over the years has been very useful to me. Yeah. And living in Orlando helped enormously, let's be honest. Um, being able to go and see the latest parks and the latest where money is no object, seemingly. <laughs> Um, it, it's a bit demoralizing when you go and see a Star Wars or a Harry Potter and then you have to, have to descope yours by a factor of six or seven hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
And I have a question for you, and uh, it's related to something you talked about a, a minute ago about really building advocacy within the community and being able to do that with Lego Lego Land with with the businesses in Winter Haven, just the the local residents. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to be a, a part of the opening team of a few parks, and one of them was Lego Land, uh, and I and I sensed that directly. If I would go out to eat, people were were excited to see you know Lego Land employees in in the restaurant and just. Uh, uh, just sort of being able to to feel the energy outside the gates of the park, but very close by. Uh, another park that I worked at that I, I won't say what it is, but those who know me can probably guess what it is. I didn't build the same advocacy with the local community. And that was also sensed. I would go and get a haircut and they would ask where I worked. And they found out I worked at the park and they I could see like their shoulders drop. Like they didn't even want to like cut my hair. Right. Uh, and, and it was that type of uh, it was it was a completely night and day mentality in terms of just really embracing the locals so the locals can embrace back and really advocate for the park and and go visit you know obviously become annual pass holders should be you know should be the goal but even just just wanting you there in general uh should be enough and i'm curious if uh if we can dive a little bit deeper into yeah. how you're really able to to build that well well the first thing i'd say is don't be arrogant um gauge, uh, build a relationship with the, uh, the there, are, there are a key number of connectors, people who you trust. So when I went into the Winterhaven community, there were, there were a few commissioners, there was the, you know, Bob Gurnett on the chamber, there was a lot of people that I would listen to, who I trusted. I also knew who not to trust, uh, and there were names that I would not listen to, because I, I generally just thought, no. Um, and then there were a few things that we did that set the stall out early days. The past owners of Cypress Gardens have left under a cloud, for example. And I was very acutely aware of that because people were telling me what this, that and the other. And um, so we, we brought the locals in, the immediate locals who were within a radius and we cooked them in, uh, we had a nice steak dinner. And honestly, the, the room was relatively hostile because they, they, they'd been dealt badly by the people before. And we showed them our plans and we slaughtered the myths and, the, and the, the sacred cows that have become sacred cows. Uh, and some of them were absolutely outrageous. We were going to buy all their houses. We were going to buy, I bet the best one was we were going to buy public over the road and turn it into a casino, which I thought was quite a good idea, but there you go. But, <laughs> but obviously we weren't going to do that. Um, but there was a lot of anger about uh, the bell ringing in the water park, the demarcation line by the water park, and uh, the noise and this, that. So, and there was a house that we apparently we owned that had been, squatters had been in it, you name it, you know, everything was coming at me. So what did we do? We were very sympathetic to it, first and foremost, we listened. So we did a Q&A with them and they asked about the bell. I said, well, we'll remove the bell then. Next question. Um, what about the demarcation line? Well, we'll we we'll, won't do a fence that's six foot per code with chain link. We'll do a, a wooden fence. We'll make it eight foot. Next, next question: the house. Right, we'll knock it down, and we did. We knocked it down, and we created more demarcation lines. So they had nowhere to go. Um, and to be fair, they were silly things to me. Um, but we also made sure they got annual passes so they could come in and see it and they could experience it. And we, we did what we said. And that was the first thing. The second thing was I and my team made, my, made ourselves very open to um, presentations and visits, whoever they were. So I remember the one I went to, there was a, as you know, there's a lot of, um, um, I, use, I don't know how to say the polite way of saying it, old folks' homes. Um, you know, where they have these senior living, that's it, senior living places. And some of them in Florida are massive. And they're, and they're right around there. There's one that I went to and I did a presentation. And I was expecting, you know, a few people, a few 20, 30 people in a hall. There was 500 people that came out to see the guy from Legoland do a presentation. And I was quite intimidated because they were all a bit like, what are you doing with our Cypress Gardens? You're not going to build houses on there. You're not going to do that. So I just broke the ice by saying something like, who in the room here has gone skinny dipping in the Florida pool, which is the famous <laughs> Florida pool at the... And they all just... <laughs> you know, getting out of the wheelchairs. 
And um, it just broke the ice. And it was fortunate because I was following uh, this guy who was talking about fire safety, and he was the most boring man on planet Earth. So it was it was quite easy for me to break the ice. <laughs> So to answer your question sensibly, a lot of hard work, uh, understanding that it really meant a lot to the locals and putting us out there, being available and doing what we said we'd do and doing it quickly. And it's not difficult. It was just that you've got to put a lot of time and effort and attention and, and put importance on it. Um, there, was one, there was one example of it, actually. When we moved the road... Or Legoland, there was one of those memorials where somebody had been killed on the road um, with flowers and things. I remember this one, and we're thinking, well, the road's got to go. Now, I remember one guy telling me, don't worry, no, I just do it. I said, no, no, no. We, so we found the family, and we dedicated to this day in the Cypress Gardens, there is a tree and a bench that we built, and we moved that dedication into the gardens itself and gave the family annual passes for life. So they could go and see the the memorial, and um, so there was just little gestures like that that were big from a cultural and a you know to show that we care, um, and I think that 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 kind of stuff resonates and made a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think showing the community that you care enough to listen and then back those things up sounded like it was you know critical to that to that process. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if we can uh, shift gears back to Zip World uh, just for a second, because please, I'm, please I'm, do. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated again by the underground golf, but also all of your attractions. Um, one of the things that um, we see in lots of different installations are, you know, VR versions of some of the things that you can do. You can put on a headset and and you're flying over something or you can actually do virtual golf right in different places. So I'm curious kind of your thoughts on how do you market, you know, the, the real thing versus virtual where it might be a little easier or might be, might be a little bit more um, uh, palatable to a consumer to put on the headset versus getting on the fastest zip line in the world. Now, maybe you have a different audience, you know, that's looking for that thrill versus looking for the, the lower end thrill. But I'm just curious, like where you see your space um, in these, in these thrills and, and these family activities versus, you know, what we're also seeing in a lot of places, which is kind of the virtual version of some of the things that you offer. Yeah. One of the things that we've done with our branding actually is, and, and as you know, I worked in immersive uh, art installations, um, not necessarily, and I've worked with VR companies as well, great companies, actually. The, I don't think you can replicate the wind in your hair moment and the theater that is created about going up these quarries and into this inc these incredible iconic um, uh, environments, um, you can't replicate that in VR. You just can't. Uh, you can try and you can do things with it, but it's one of those things that we are building memories, is what I say. And people will, you know, the reason that our marketing is so effective is because when you go on it, you want to show off you've done it, you've been brave. So there's these milestone moments, as we call them, you know, typically a, a 50th birthday, a 40th birthday, you know, whatever it may be, a birthday. And we get a lot of that. Um, so to answer your question, I think that VR has its place as an ex brand extension in certain, you know, um, arcades or theme parks or whatever it may be. Not with our brand. Our brand is about wind in your hair, in the elements, you feel the rain, you feel all that, and there's something about that. And I always just said the same about a real roller coaster versus a VR roller coaster. They're, they're good VR, but they're not roller coasters. They're not, you know, they don't make, they can make you sick, but not the same. <laughs> um, there's something about that big piece of steel, that big zip line, that big, that, that, but also the people piece, the theater, the story, and making it come alive and that apprehension as you go up the quarry and the trucks um and then you're you know you meet the instructor and it's real you're wearing it you're like oh my goodness and then the release and the way you go you can't copy that uh in a vr you you because you're in your front room or you're in an arcade somewhere and it's so it's 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 part of the environment part of the experience and it's it's safe you know it's safe inherently as it lines are safe but you you're scared out your wits <laughs> as you are on roller coasters. Same difference, you know. 
Yeah. So it adds a, another level of, of apprehension by doing it in real life. But then I think one of the things that, that you said too, from the market marketability standpoint is the guest-driven marketing, is that it, it is more shareable. You're more likely to go spend a, a milestone birthday or, you know, or, or kind of uh, do it a greater level of outing and then and then share it with your friends and family that uh, that you did this, right? People are are selecting not just the experience, but the memory of the experience, and they want something that they can brag about and really be able to showcase. And while VR might be able to replicate a lot of the parts of the experience, uh, the end result and the memory, which can still be very positive, is yeah, I did that and it was really cool. Versus, I went and you know brought my family here for you know milestone birthday, or, you know this uh, you know once in a lifetime type of uh, type of experience. So. Um, so it's interesting the the difference in the product itself and the and the difference in the guests uh, uh, perception of of having done the experience too. Yeah, I think the the marketing is one of the reasons I joined as well as it will is because I I just thought the that wow moment that awesome moment you know those are the things that in, in some ways roller coasters and theme parks you know you maybe get that when you first go on a ride experience but they're a little bit samey now um, and and the zip world is something that is out of this world you know, underground golf cabins, you know, you can't replicate 200 years of caves, you know, you just can't do that. Um, so the, these unique environments are quite important to us in terms of our growth as well. And then we extend the brand into accommodation and, you know, and, and other family brands that we're doing in, in conventional tree uh, forest type environments. So, Aid, I have a, a two-part question. It's sort of on the enthusiast side of the of the world. Um, do you have a favorite Zip World attraction, and what what would be your favorite non-Zip World attraction that you have experienced as a guest? Ooh, bloody hell! Well, I have to say, Velocity Two. Um, Velocity Two is uh, is our signature experience at Penryn Quarry in North Wales, the fastest zip line in the world. But the sheer environment that's out of this world, the theatre around it is... I went on it and signed at the bottom. I just wrote, where do I sign for this job? I want this job. <laughs> um, and it was very smart. The owner, Sean, put me on that, actually. But um, but I think that's that's I think that's probably my equal tie with the caverns product, which is the zip lines through the caverns. There's about there's 20 or 27 zip lines that go through, and, and we've got, like, nets and climbing up the wall. That's just cool uh so that's probably equal time with that product that i've been on for somewhere else recently i god i trouble is i've been on the best i mean the one that blew me away was uh star wars rise of the resistance <laughs> but but in my lego one days i used to say uh you know the toy story ride was actually just did exactly what it said on the tin it was the most cool kitty ride i've ever been on Still is probably, um, but we use that as a benchmark for Ninjago actually. But um, but no, I think Rise of the Resistance is probably just I, I like Star Trek, Star Wars, and Marvel and all that stuff. But uh, that ride blew my mind. Um, it took it to a whole level beyond you know Spider Man, Transformers, and Harry Potter. It just went that extra level with the story, the theming, and indoor, outdoor simulator ride, and it was like it was just what next you know and when the lightsaber came through the loop roof i just i just i just thought wow <laughs> i just didn't know what to say so you know you forget i've been to some of the best 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 places in the world so i would say i would say that really yeah so matt did uh tee up this question earlier uh <laughs> pun intended here but what is underground golf can you tell us about that <laughs> well yeah in american terms it's it's crazy golf but it's underground and you are doing it in caves. So there are different levels and kids can do it, but it's, it, it literally is in these incredible immense caverns and it's on different levels within the cavern. So it's just like nowhere, no crazy golf you've ever done ever. It's not like international drive in Orlando, for example, you know, where it's all pirates and everything else. No, this is just, it's industrial. It's, like mining equipment and it's themed and it's in a, in an actual cave. Um, and it's been hugely popular. But, you know, in the context of other things we do there, like the cavern tour, the, the deep mine tour, the, the zip line that we, we do there, Titan, you know, this is a beautiful 
product to complement a day there because there's other things to do as well. So the hero product is always the zip line or the cabins. And then this product feeds off it as well. Uh, and it's performed incredibly well. But it's innovative. Nobody's ever done it. Uh, and we are looking at more products in the future that will, you know, to realize the potential of, we, we, and, you know, there's, there's, there's literally 20 or 30 more caves we can go into. So it's not as if we're short of space underground to expand as well. Mm. You know, I've done some of those underground tours and I've always wondered how they get the the walkways down in there and then and forming the, but you're putting underground golf and zip lines in the cavern. So I would imagine that's got to be kind of a logistical nightmare, like to try to get all that equipment down there and build it. So, you know, is there any insight you can share about kind of how, how that happened? <laughs> it's, from what I'm told, uh, it takes a lot of time, but there are there are there are ways. You know, for example, you can lower things down where guests can't go into areas. So, for example, there is an air there's an area at the back of one of the caves which is actually open, exposed. So you can actually lower things in and move it quite easily, believe it or not. So there are there, there are hidden hidden areas. It's like the the Disney underground village, as it were. <laughs> you know, I think it's, uh, but in the case of these caves, there is opportunities to get in and lower things in and build, but it is it is complicated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so looking out into the future, and one of the things that uh, just we've read about in, uh, in the articles is that there's uh, uh, just an, an aggressive expansion plan and uh, growth plan. I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, maybe give us a glimpse into what we can expect next from ZipWorld. Well, I mean, there's, there's three real lines of business here. Uh, one is organic growth within, within the existing sites. As I've alluded to, we've got lots of opportunity to expand and improve what we're currently doing. Um, not, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean just zip, zip lines. Like that's new restaurants, that's new, new shops, new layouts, um, underground things, activities, overground activities, things that we can do a bit differently. So we call those adventures. Um, we also are looking at uh, new business development sites, so uh, quarries elsewhere, which I think there's a few of you search on uh, in the peak districts and different places like that, um, and the lake districts. So there are opportunities where we can expand our footprint into uh, existing uh, uh, places. And firstly, we're not a theme park operator. Uh, that's the first thing to say about that, because people instantly think, oh, we don't go theme park. We're not. We're very, very careful. It's very low volume compared to what theme parks are. It's quite different dynamic altogether. And actually, we are reusing old assets or old quarries that are usually abandoned and nobody's allowed near them and are a bit of a health risk, actually. So we are actually repurposing a lot of these, these facilities. Um, and then we're also doing some cool stuff. We, we've got the Sky Flyer, which is this giant hot air balloon, uh, helium balloon that we're putting, which is a tethered balloon bit like the one that's at I Drive in Orlando, uh, down to, uh, downtown uh, Disney, um, Disney Springs. And it's, um, we, 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 put, we put one in real in North Wales. And we're doing, we, so we're looking at kind of observation a little bit from that and seeing how, how, how we can explore that. And we're also working on a couple of projects in some city centre sites as well, uh, which we call our expedition brands. So they are almost in gateway cities that will, highlight the benefits of um, the summit brands, as we call them, in uh, in some of the more picturesque uh, sites in North Wales and the, the lakes and some of those. And then the other one is accommodation. We, we've, we've actually owned a hotel pub. Uh, it's more of a pub than a hotel at the moment, but we are going to be renovating it. And um, we're also looking at different uh, themed accommodations at our existing sites, which is probably no surprise to you guys, because you know what, we, what we've done within, what we did within Merlin. Um, so, uh, but these have to be unique, sympathetic to the environment that we're in and, uh, and uh, you know, heighten the experience and fit in with what that experience is at that specific location and have a set, an element of uniqueness. So quite a lot, actually, to get yeah. my teeth into. <laughs> yeah, like I said earlier, you haven't been busy to this point. And you're, it doesn't sound like you're going to get much busier uh, moving forward. So... Uh, but A, this has been a fascinating conversation and we really do appreciate your time. If people wanted to learn more about ZipWorld or get in touch with you, uh, where would you send them? 
Um, well, just go to uh, our website, look up, you know, bang on Zip World, and look through our brands and everything. And if you want to contact me, you know, I think uh, go through the go through the web page on that really, um, or look me up on LinkedIn. To be fair, it's as you know, LinkedIn's the the way to go with those kind of things. Any questions or anything like that? But you know, Zip World as a brand is somewhat embryonic. Uh, it's very confined to North Wales primarily, which is where the heartland is. But we are growing fast. And it's a beautiful brand. And I, for those of you who haven't experienced it, please come over. And mainly just because where we are in North Wales is, and Wales in general is just stunning. It's absolutely breathtaking, the beauty and the nature. And the, and it's there's not many cars either. Which, <laughs> there's not much traffic here as well. It's kind of nice. <laughs> uh, any... Uh... Any final thoughts or words of wisdom for our audience as we wrap this up? Words of wisdom, uh, other than come to Zip World. Um, <laughs> I think uh, for, for all of you who are up and coming in the leisure industry, I mean, I've been in it a long time now. I think it's, I say this to the people who come into the business. You are in the business of, of putting smiles on people's faces. And, uh, and it's been hugely rewarding for me over the years and as I become an old fossil and a dinosaur in this industry um, I look back and I think God I, I, I wouldn't want to work anywhere else I couldn't work in a factory or I couldn't work in engineering or something like that the amount of fun projects and things I've worked on the people I've met and where I've been and traveled and put smiles on people's faces and worked on some cool brands with some great people why would you want to not work in tourism and leisure you know I just don't get it all the attractions industry it's just, if you can get into it, get into it is, is the best thing I'd say. Yeah. Well, that is a great way to kind of encapsulate a wonderful conversation. Again, Aid, thank you so much for your, for your time today and all of your insight. And for everybody who's out there watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.